The Secular Student Alliance is excited to announce our annual scholarship offerings. The application opens today and is available through August of 2021. You can learn more at secularstudents.org slash scholarships. The Do No Harm Act protects every American's right to practice a religion or no religion at all, as long as they don't harm others. It restores the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, or RIFRA, to what it was supposed to do. 30 years ago, a diverse group of Americans came together to pass a law that was intended to protect the free exercise of religion, especially for religious minorities. But unfortunately, RIFRA has been exploited to allow discrimination against LGBTQ people, women, religious minorities, and the non-religious. For example, universities and employers have used RIFRA to deny health care to students and workers. The Do No Harm Act will make sure that the law does not allow anyone to use their religious beliefs to harm others. You can help by going to au.org and urging your member of Congress to become a co-sponsor of the Do No Harm Act. Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us for our third panel of today. Um, I'm Janelle Kronk, the National Organizing Manager with the Secular Student Alliance, um, and I'm pleased to introduce you all to Clara Feng, who will be with us today talking about um, how we can use democracy to solve climate change problems. So uh, Clara is the Student Engagement Director for the Citizens Climate Lobby, and in her role, she works with students on climate action, um, overseeing the CCL campus chapters. Uh, she helps members conduct outreach to higher education. Uh, Clara has 15 years of experience in sustainability and higher education and holds a master's of environmental management from Yale University. She is also a PhD candidate at Antioch University in New England. Um, and we're really excited to have you here today to, to share um, a bit about um, your organizing. And uh, so following the presentation, we will have a chance to um, have some questions answered. So. Uh, feel free to put those in the Q&A or the chat throughout the presentation and we'll get to those um, at the end. So without further ado, I'll, I'll pass it off to you. Thanks, Janelle. Well, thank you everyone for joining me on what is probably a lovely Saturday afternoon. I'm sure there are other interesting things that you could be doing, but I really appreciate you spending the time with me to learn about using the tools of democracy for climate action. So I'm gonna start by sharing my slides. Uh, present. So um, the introduction pretty much covered my slide here. Um, I'm student engagement director at Citizens Climate Lobby, and I'm also pursuing my PhD currently in environmental studies. Uh, and I live in Detroit, Michigan. So probably like a lot of you, um, when, when I was uh, a kid, I was very interested in environmental problems and conservation. And I did things in my own life to uh, reduce my environmental impact, as I'm sure many of you were interested in doing. So things like recycling and reducing and reusing. You know, growing up in a Chinese family, my family was always never leaving the lights on and use all leftovers and would never throw anything out. So was very uh, brought up in that conservation ethic you know, helping with clean, uh, um, stream cleanings and um, recycling in my school. Um, so from a young age, I was involved in um, environmental activism in this way. Then when I went to Smith College for my undergraduate, I participated in our campus um, Earth Rep program. Um, now on campuses, mostly they're called Eco Reps. So, you know, we would help our dorms, um, become more green, saving energy, recycling, all of that. Um, I did a, a campus-wide paperless campaign um, where I convinced the school to switch to an online calendar for um, 
all of their announcements instead of mailing everybody little flyers in everybody's mailbox. Um, this seems ancient, I know, but back then we actually did this um, until um, my campaign helped them to, to convert to a um, paperless system. Um, I also did a campaign with the Massachusetts um, PERG uh, where um, we organized to protest drilling in the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge. And through that campaign, um, I was first involved in political organizing and um, using advocacy on um, a national environmental issue. So um, after college and, and after my, my graduate degree in environmental studies, um, I worked as um, a sustainability manager at several institutions. So for example, um, I worked in the mayor's office of sustainability in Albany, New York, where you know, we looked at how, uh, creating a, a climate action plan for the city government and calculating the greenhouse gas inventory for the whole city. Um, and I worked at several higher ed institutions, including Towson University in Maryland, doing their greenhouse gas inventory and climate action plan and sustainability plan. So now I was working at the institutional level um, to help a, a large entity uh, become more sustainable. Um, but doing these jobs, it made me realize that, that this wasn't really enough. And you know, I can reduce my own impact and I can help my community around me reduce their impact. But um, uh, to really create the change we needed to solve a problem as large as climate change, we had to utilize political power and get our governments to, to take action. So in recent years, I've been really inspired by the activism of young people like Greta Thunberg, um, the Sunrise Movement, um, our Children's Trust with their lawsuit um, against the US government and their calls in, in the um, halls of Congress and, and towards world leaders saying, you know, we, we have done our part and it's time that you step up and do yours and our futures demand it. I love this quote from um, Bill McKibben who uh, uh, started by writing about climate change and uh, later founded 350.org, an international organization focused on climate activism. So he writes, we don't have time for incremental individual change changes. This is just a physical constraint that we're dealing with. And so the most important thing an individual can do is be less of an individual. Join together with other people in movements large enough to affect change in policy and economics that might actually move the system enough to matter. You can't do it anymore one light bulb, one vegan dinner at a time. What we need you to be is effective citizens moving policy. Citizenship has not been a thing we've been best at in this country in recent years, and we're paying the price in a number of places. But the most obvious probably and the most long-term damage is what we're doing to the physical systems of the earth. So I um, was fortunate enough to find out about an organization called Citizens Climate Lobby that uh, works precisely in this matter, which is getting people to act together collectively to exert political power and influence our government to take action on climate change. Um, I first joined them in 2016 and attended their um, national conference. And I was just so blown away uh, by being in a group of um, 800 climate activists at the time, all uh, dedicated to, to doing the same thing and fighting for the policies that we want to see uh, and, and not feeling alone. Um, and, and that like, like together we could actually do something really impactful. So um, if you are advocating, calling for big change, um, it's not enough to just protest what you don't want, but to advocate for a solution that you do want. So what makes for a good climate solution? And as Citizens Climate Lobby, we have really um, looked at these criteria as, as uh, what we need in terms of good climate policy. So that means it drives large scale change quickly. Um, you know, we're not doing this one institution at a time. We need across the economy wide, um, national, international change. And to do this quickly, because we don't have a lot of time. Um, the policy needs to look out for those who can least afford rising energy costs um, and not um, disadvantage poor people. It needs to be good for the planet, obviously, and good for the economy. 
uh, durable will stick around. So that means that, you know, if we have a change in uh, a power in the uh, White House, then um, it won't go away, that a law passed by Congress will be durable, and that it uses intense incentives to support choice. So um, for, for CCL, this is important because um, having, having choice means that more people will be able to support it and more of the economy can participate. So the Energy Innovation and Carbon Dividend Act, which uh, was introduced in the House of Representatives first in 2018, really embodies all of those principles. So it was introduced by Ted Deutsch, a Democrat of Florida. Um, he was the original sponsor, um, first introduced in November 2018, and then reintroduced this year, April 1st. So, so far we have 36 co-sponsors uh, for this bill and they are all over the country. Um, and this climate le legislation actually has more co-sponsors than uh, pretty much any other climate legislation we have right now. So I'm gonna explain a little bit about what it is and how it works. So, um, the Energy Innovation and Carbon Dividend Act is a carbon fee and dividend. So it charges a fee on fossil fuels at the source, which means that a, place is, a price is placed on carbon um, that is charged on, on energy companies and those that um, extract the fossil fuels from the mine, the well, or the port. The um, revenue that is generated by the tax or the fee uh, is uh, collected by the government and allocated to households as a dividend. Um, and in this model, 100% of it is allocated minus administration costs. It also includes a carbon border adjustment. So this means that a fee is placed on goods imported from countries that do not have a carbon fee. Um, and this ensures that companies don't relocate overseas to avoid the tax, um, and that um, goods that have uh, coming from countries with a carbon price are not at a disadvantage. So this proposal has um, a number of benefits. Um, and these benefits have been well studied. The most important one is a 2019 study um, from Columbia University that models the impacts of the 2019 Energy Innovation Act on US carbon emissions, air pollution, household, dividend payments. Um, and if you have the access to the slides later, if you click on these blue links, it will take you to those studies. Um, and then there were a few others done as well. Um, so these benefits are um, gotten through uh, the economic modeling. So one of the benefits is that this policy will reduce America's carbon pollution by 30% in the first five years alone. And it's the single most powerful tool we have to get us to net zero by 2050. So scientists have been telling us that um, in order to keep global warming below 1.5 degrees Celsius, we need to get our emissions to zero by 2050. And this policy is the single most powerful one to, to actually get us there. It will incentivize affordable clean energy. So with this policy, the government sets the direction and businesses respond in order to provide abundant, affordable, and reliable clean energy. This clean energy innovation will drive us faster towards net zero pollution. So the way that this happens is that the price makes the cost of fossil fuels more expensive and clean energy will be cheaper in comparison um, and businesses and utilities will um, be able to switch to uh, affordable clean energy. It will greatly reduce air pollution, um, which will save lives. So this policy will improve health and save 4.5 million American lives over the next 50 years by reducing pollution Americans breathe. Poor air quality is responsible for as many as one in 10 American deaths today and sickens thousands more. This policy uh, also puts money in people's pockets. It's affordable for ordinary Americans because the money collected from the fee is given as a monthly dividend or carbon cashback payment to every American to spend with no restrictions. Most low and middle income Americans will come out financially ahead or break even. 
Um, so uh, we have some concrete calculations for this. Um, in, in 10 years, the, this bill will generate approximately $3,000 in annual dividends for a family of four. A price in carbon will put Americans back to work in well-paid, stable local jobs in clean energy and energy efficiency. An investment in clean energy today will lead to approximately three times as many jobs as an investment in fossil fuels. So you know, this has been well studied that if you put money into clean energy development, this generates a lot more jobs than um, more uh, um, fossil fuel developments. So it also keeps businesses healthy. Businesses prefer a carbon price to other climate solutions because they remain financially stable while they adjust their operations, thanks to a predictable and gradually rising price on carbon. They will not lose time or spend extra money trying to understand complicated new regulations and rules and incorporate them into their plans. So with this uh, legislation, the carbon price will start at $15 per ton of, of CO2 and um, uh, increase $10 per year. So businesses can easily calculate um, what kind of energy increase they might expect uh, next year or 10 or 50 years down the line. And this helps them plan and adapt. Um, so uh, they can continue to, to operate their businesses and adopt more clean energy measures um, without sort of this market instability that other uh, climate re regulations might induce. So a carbon price would also support a strong economy in that it is the most cost-effective way to lower America's pollution. To match its impact, multiple regulations across economic sectors would be meet needed at an additional cost of hundreds of billions of dollars every year to America's economy. The net climate and health benefits of a carbon tax are estimated at 800 billion each year. If we fail to take climate action, economists estimate that global wealth could fall by 25% by 2100, with an increasing number of Americans falling into poverty. So another really strong advantage of this bill is that it is extremely simple and elegant. It is applied across the economy. Um, so instead of you know, regulations for every sector and every state and um, many things that uh, are very complicated for businesses and consumers to figure out, figure out, and then also takes a lot of money to administer. A carbon price is a simple rule that can be applied to all sectors. So um, I can, uh, I'll pause here a few minutes to uh, answer any questions people have about the legislation. And then I will talk about how students, especially can um, support climate action and climate legislation through the tools that we have developed, the CCL, and which um, are used in lobbying members of Congress. Awesome. I'll give folks a second um, to put any questions you have about the legislation in the chat, but um, I'd like to ask a little bit about the dividend structure mm -hmm. and how that was kind of decided as the strategy. Um, as opposed to giving those funds, you know, to say clean energy projects, what, um, what was behind the decision to give those payments directly to um, citizens? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, uh, there are uh, different carbon pricing bills and some of them do um, allocate the, the revenue to specific projects. Um, CCL prefers this solution where all of the revenue is allocated to households because one, it, it makes it popular with, with citizens um, and therefore you know, it makes it easier for people to support that, that solution. Um, in British Columbia, where this carbon fee and dividend was implemented, it was really popular with their constituents and people got money back. Um, so they were able to implement that across Canada a few years later and it really reduced their emissions and did not har harm their economy. Um, also, um, uh, conservatives favor this a little bit more because it doesn't grow the government. Um, it gives money back to, to American citizens and, and they can decide how to spend the money and then it helps to stimulate local economic growth. Um, and the third thing is, you know, if people 
in government are deciding, okay, you know, I want this money to go towards like clean energy or infrastructure, um, then it's very easy for there to be fighting, you know, for about people's pet projects and what they think the money could go towards. So it's just um, more neutral to say, we're just gonna give it back to people. Thank you. And then we had a question in the chat, which I think you kind of touched upon, but how would this bill deal with imports of unsustainable energy, such as oil and gas? Would they be taxed once they enter the country? Um, right, so um, the uh, tax would be applied to, to all fossil fuel um, that is being um, produced in the, in the country and imported into the country. Um, and also goods that are coming into the country um, that do not have a carbon price put on it will be um, uh, administered a, a, a border adjustment so that um, they are not uh, disadvantaged, so that local goods that, that do have a carbon tax are not disadvantaged. Thank you. And then we have a question from Kimberly. Uh, what resources would you provide people who don't believe there is strong evidence that action on climate change is important? That action on climate change is important? <laughs> um, For, yeah, to convince, yeah, I, I, convince people that less don't believe Less and less people important. believe that, I hope. <laughs> um, yeah, I would say um, for the real deniers, uh, really there's, we don't need to put so much energy into convincing them because more than half of uh, Americans do believe that climate change is, is real and human cost and, and is an important priority. So really focus on act activating the people who are concerned and alarmed, but they just don't know how to take action. Like if we can mobilize the people who are concerned and, to, and translate that into action, then we will be uh, powerful. Thank you. Um, and I have one more question for you. Um, I was interested in kind of the comment you made that not wanting to, this to, you know, negatively impact poor people. So I guess one could imagine that if the price of carbon is going up, then, you know, once the, the goods get to, to citizens, the price will also increase. So is that um, factor, factored into the dividend receivable or is there any um, kind of, um, I guess, information on how, how it would impact prices in the meantime while folks transition to clean ener energy? Yeah, um, so we do expect that by putting the price on carbon, um, the, the cost of goods will, will increase a little bit, if, especially if they're energy intensive, like gasoline prices, for example. Um, but the, um, the increase will be uh, fairly, fairly minor and, and, uh, and like given time, businesses are able to adapt to those increase in prices. And then the dividends given back to the households will help com compensate for that. Um, and especially for lower income households, the dividend is probably gonna be more than the increase to uh, the, the, the cost of energy. Um, lower household incomes, uh, lower income households pay a little bit less in terms of their energy use. So um, in the end, they will come out ahead. Thank you. And then Stephanie put in um, a recommendation for folks trying to deal with uh, uh, climate skeptics. So I just went ahead and put that in the chat. So that's something you guys can, can check out as well. Yeah, thanks. There's, there's definitely a lot of resources out there. Um, on my website, citizensclimatehighered.org, we have a section that, that has some good articles that are like frequently asked questions about climate change, debunking climate myths. Um, yeah, tons of good resources available. Awesome. And, uh, we have a question. What is the anticipated impact of a gallon of gasoline? The anticipated impact, like how much more it would cost? Um, possibly. I'm not sure they're, <laughs> they're intended. <laughs> yeah, maybe. Yeah. yeah what, um, it, what would it impact on a gallon of gas? Maybe. Right. I, I don't have the numbers off the top of my head. I mean, it depends a lot on what the right prices are currently or what they're going to be 10 years from now. Um, but, you know, we're not looking at like a doubling of the price or something. We're talking about um, in the range of like, like 10% to 30% more. Thank you. Does anybody else have any other questions before we move forward? 
Yeah, so um, I invite you to um, express your support for the Energy and Innovation Act, or even just um, um, climate action in general through our um, youth testimonials. And I'm gonna put the link in the chat here. So at this link, um, uh, you'll be able to add a, um, a statement saying why you support carbon pricing and um, a photo, if you can contribute that, um, please include your city and state. Uh, and through this collection method, we have created postcards that we have mailed to the White House um, for Earth Day, and we have generated um, tweets and um, uh, letters to members of Congress. So if you can share your testimonial with us, then we will be sure to share them with your members of Congress and amplify your voice this way. All right, so I'm gonna move ahead um, in the presentation. And if you wanna do the kudo board simultaneously, you can do that. So I'm gonna share a little more about Citizens Climate Lobby, who we are and how we can help people exercise their political power. So um, CCL's mission is to create the political will for climate solutions by enabling individual breakthroughs in personal and political power. And I really love this mission because of the way it emphasizes um, uh, how we can be empowered to um, influence the decisions uh, that affect all of our, our futures um, and that you know, we're not just limited to reducing our um, own carbon footprints, but really by acting together, we are taking control of our future as a country. CCL has over 596 groups now throughout the world and over 190,000 supporters in our network. Um, so it was founded in 2007 and over a you know, period of 12 years, we just have grown a huge amount all over the country and internationally. So our volunteers utilize what we call the five levers of political will to influence legislation. They are lobbying, media relations, grassroots outreach, grass tops engagement, and group development. So I'm gonna be talking um, specifically about some of the actions that um, students can take to exercise these five levers of political will. So um, one thing we've seen youth do with tremendous effect is um, like the, the school strikes um, and other climate strikes. So this is really about showing up, right? Like you're in the streets, you're, you're saying, you know, we, we need to see, see change and uh, we care and, and we're uh, visible. So um, in addition to that, what's also really important is, is to speak up. Um, after you've been in the streets, you know, how do you actually make your legislators hear you? So um, CCL has created these really effective tools to help you get in touch with your members of Congress and to do so on a regular basis. So we have um, developed this Write Congress tool, um, and then there are similar tools for calling Congress and tweeting Congress. But basically, um, you click on this link, and then you put in your um, address, and it will um, display for you the um, names of your members of Congress. So here I have, I'm in Michigan. So there's Debbie Stabenow and Gary Peters. And then there's this email that's already generated for you. That's saying it says, climate change is a high priority issue for me. I'm writing today to ask the Senator to take action to solve climate change and to include a carbon fee as part of the solution. So it's best if you personalize this, um, but basically the tool already has their emails embedded. And when you click send, um, it will send that email to both of them. Um, and we really believe in contacting your members of Congress uh, as, as often as you can um, and to have lots of people doing this. So with this tool, you can do it in two clicks essentially. Um, the, the call Congress and the tweet Congress tool are also very similar. Like if you do call Congress, um, instead of this sort of dialogue box, you'll see their phone numbers 
and then a message that you can tell them once uh, you have called into the office. Um, another way that people can engage with their members of Congress is to follow them on social media. So pretty much all the members of Congress today have Facebook and Twitter. A lot of them also have Instagram. So by following them, you know, they'll um, give updates on the legislation that they're supporting or st sponsoring, maybe things that they don't support. So give them likes um, uh, when they do something that you like, um, give them comments. Um, a lot of times they only receive negative comments from people who oppose what they're doing on climate action or other helpful things. Um, so uh, having more people give them positive comments and thank yous really makes a difference. And using Twitter, you can also ask them to do specific things. So every once in a while, we'll ask everybody, you know, all 190,000 supporters in CCL to tweet their members of Congress with the same message. And um, uh, our, the staff people in the members of Congress office read all of those. Like they count, you know, how many emails they get in support of carbon pricing every week, how many tweets they got, how many likes they got. Um, and a tweet is just as good as an email or a phone call. Um, and uh, they've told us that uh, 20 tweets on an issue will get their legislators' attention. Um, we also do a lot of writing for print and digital media. Um, so in my work with young people, a lot of them have written letters to the editor or op-eds um, and published them in their local newspapers. Um, or, you know, they can publish it on their own social media or in their school's paper or on our blog and then amplify that message uh, throughout their networks. We also do a lot of work in uh, meeting with our members of Congress and speaking to them in person. We find that this is the best way to develop a relationship with them and to uh, give them um, information about climate action. So CCL... Uh, has three lobby drives every year. Um, our upcoming one is in June. Um, and uh, in the past, we would all go to DC and uh, meet with our members of Congress on the Hill for two days. Um, but this year we're doing it virtually um, and we meet with every member of Congress uh, on, on Capitol Hill, um, so over 500 of them. And in every meeting, we are respectful and prepared. Um, and, you know, it's, it's sort of like taking that message you're shouting into the streets right into their office. So in addition to our June lobby day, we also do one in November and in March. So if you want to lobby with us, um, this upcoming uh, conference, uh, just register for our conference at cclusa.org slash conference. It's free um, and you'll get an invitation on um, how to join a lobby meeting with your local members of Congress. So um, getting involved. Um, it's uh, been shown that if you do actions with other people, um, you'll have more fun doing it and do it more regularly. So a lot of my work is getting people to take action together um, and also get credit because we know that college students are busy and um, getting credit uh, is a big motivator and, and can help them in other ways. So um, my uh, ways of getting involved here go from easier to harder. So the easiest thing, simplest thing you can do is to follow us on social media. You can find our website at citizensclimatelobby.org. And if you fill out the join form there, then that puts you on a mailing list and you'll get our um, weekly news, weekly briefing um, with actions that you can take every week on climate action. Um, you can follow us on Facebook and uh, uh, Instagram and Twitter. Um, and uh, on those platforms, we share articles on carbon pricing and actions and, you know, who are the most recent members of Congress that have co-sponsored the bill. Lots of very helpful things to help you stay up to date. CCL's members are organized into over 500 chapters across the country. So there is a very good chance that there is one near you. Um, 
So you can join at citizensclimatelobby.org slash VALCCL slash chapters, and you can browse all of our chapters across the country. Um, and with your local chapter, you can get involved in, in um, tabling and other kinds of advocacy ap actions with a group. Um, our online members also have access to a virtual community um, and uh, those people have formed action teams. So we have um, a higher education action team um, just for college students. We have a youth action team for uh, youth under 18, um, people of the global majority or for people of color, um, various sort of diversity groups. We have um, many faith groups, skill supporting groups, so these are all national action teams um, where you can focus on your area of interest. We conduct a lot of training to help people become educated in using the tools of democracy because being a citizen um, requires a lot of uh, training and, and knowledge. Um, and you know, in general, Americans are, are fairly poorly educated in this aspect. So we have, um, uh, a webinar series, um, there's 12 webinars in all that gives you the basics of taking this type of action. So you can learn the um, science of climate change, the basic economics of carbon fee and dividend, understanding the basics of Congress, lobbying, telling stories, using social media, grassroots outreach, all of these um, really useful skills. And if you want to get credit and do um, this program systematically, we we'll offer a 12-week um, certificate program um, where if you complete all of the requirements, it leads you to a certificate of completion. Um, and you can sign up for our summer course uh, um, until May 31st, begins on June 1st at citizensclimatehighered.org slash training. Um, and through this program, You'll participate in nine of the core volunteer trainings, um, attend our, our national conference, write or submit a letter uh, to the editor or op-ed and participate in a lobby meeting. And then um, this course can be done over 15 weeks, about two hours a week. So you can do it while taking other classes or if you have a full-time summer internship. Um, we also offer uh, um, internships to college and graduate students that uh, want to work with us behind the scenes. Um, so uh, these are our different departments that offer different internships. If you don't have a um, chapter near where you live or you want to motivate other students to take at climate action with you, you can join our campus leaders program. We support students in this program to start their own climate campaign or CCL chapter at their school. So we have had many campus chapters um, throughout the years who have done all kinds of wonderful things. They've come with us to lobby their members of Congress. They've gotten their college president's endorsement. Um, here's the NYU team presenting at the United Nations. Um, the Princeton climate team um, work on a lot of sustainability issues, not just carbon pricing. Um, so our campus chapters have a lot of freedom to do work that they find is interesting and get supported through um, our staff. We have another program, um, uh, fellows who are um, advanced student leaders that get paid to um, help us do outreach to higher ed and support new campus leaders. So these students join a, a group of highly motivated experienced student leaders to mentor other climate leaders um, and help us expand our outreach uh, to students throughout the country. So if you um, are a campus leader um, or want to do some more education on your own campus, uh, we provide resources to, to help you show a climate film or invite a climate speaker to your campus or host a forum um, and uh, um, organize actions um, around that event. Um, a lot of our uh, uh, volunteers have been working on getting college and university presidents endorsements. So that's an area where students can have a lot of power 
since um, college presidents uh, love to hear from their students and, um, you know, pay attention if you are saying to them, you know, we, we want climate action and we want you to endorse this bill. Um, so over the years, we have gotten endorsements from college presidents at, at all these different schools. Uh, currently, we have 73 schools on our list. All right, so I'm pretty much at the end here. Um, so you can uh, join CCL at cclusa.org. If you wanna see more resources for students and how to get involved in our internships, campus leader program, regional fellows program, then go to citizensclimatehighered.org. Uh, and I'll leave you with this quote here by uh, Lois Marie Gibbs. Slavery was abolished, child labor was ended, women won the right to vote, labor won the right to organize, Segregation of public facilities was ended. The war in Vietnam was stopped. DDT was banned. Countries stopped above ground nuclear testing. Families won the right to manage their own fertility. The Berlin Wall came down. Apartheid ended. Each of these societal leaps resulted from the leap of faith of ordinary people who joined together in organized and persistent efforts to demand and win change. So it may seem like, you know, climate change is just such an intractable issue and we are hardly making any pro progress. And yet lots of things that seemed impossible at the time uh, did get changed. And um, when, after it happened, it seemed like, yeah, of course it happened, but it happened because many, many people got together and persistently organized and demanded change and we can make this happen. Thank you so much. Um, that was great to hear about all the different opportunities that folks have to get engaged. I just want to start out with a question um, about uh, what advice you would have to our Secular Student Alliance chapter leaders um, uh, about how they can get involved, whether that's, you know, bringing a speaker or something like that, kind of what, what would be your advice on their first step they can take if they want to get into climate advocacy? Yeah, um, I think... Um learning a little bit about it. So you, you can certainly bring a, um, a live speaker to, to your event and we can do a presentation, very probably similar to the one that I just did to talk about the bill and what CCL is. Um, and we also have recordings on our website. Um, so if you want to learn more about say like the economics of carbon fee and dividend, or you wanna learn about how to lobby Congress, um, you can watch those webinars together. Um, and then you can organize your students to take action with us. So do you want to join us for lobby day in June? You know, just uh, let, let me know. <laughs> um, or like contact uh, the, the general um, line at CCL and they'll connect you to your local chapter. Um, do you want to organize your group to write emails to Congress um, or, or send them testimonials? Uh, it's really effective to do things uh, in a group. Yeah, I would definitely recommend as you know a meeting topic to our, our chapter leaders like you know we we do a lot of stuff around Earth Day and things like that but you know mm -hmm. setting you know one meeting a semester to really focus on these issues and, and learn more about them and also spread the word so um, we did have a question in the chat of uh, from Mia who said where can I go to find the full details of the summer program and or internships um, costs etc. Yeah. Um... It's probably most comprehensive if you can get the whole slide deck, uh, which I imagine this conference will make it available to you, but I'll put some links in the chat. Um, so if you go to Citizens Climate Higher Ed such training, you can sign up for the summer program. Um, cool, and yeah, we will our, send, send out the slides if you, if you make them available to us. So everybody um, that's RSVP'd here today will have access to those. Yeah. A lot of the other things I talked about are also just on this website in general. Oh, perfect. And then uh, we had a question from Rick who said, how can we make a meeting with our Congress people productive when they adamantly oppose our goals and objectives? <laughs> um, yes, that's, that's a situation that we sometimes encounter. Um, so I think what inspires me about that is um, people, people do change and you never know how that might happen for them. You know, uh, at CCL, like we have, um, 
uh, I think it's Jerry Taylor. Um, he's one of these libertarian leaders that years ago was a public climate denier. And now he's become a huge climate advocate in the conservative party. Um, and he like speaks to us at CCL conferences and he tells his conversion story about how, you know, he used to think this was uh, a hoax or whatever. And, and he was convinced by the science. Um, we also have members of Congress who, yeah, like, like they didn't like this issue or didn't want to talk about it. Um, and over time we have seen them come around. You know, some of it is because we, we have come to their offices every year, three times a year to talk about this issue. And also the, the climate in general has, has changed a lot where now it's not um, like a huge cost to a Republican to talk about climate change and, and definitely not for Democrats. Um, so even in the last four years, we have seen a huge change in this regard. So you just keep talking to them and certainly your, your work and everybody's work getting out there and having these conversations is moving that, that lever forward and unfortunately seeing more um, environmental disasters and, and whatnot too, I think can impact people's perception. Right. We just had a, a comment from one of our uh, faculty supporters, Stephanie, who said, this is an excellent presentation. Thank you. Um, please let me know whether I can share this with my environmental science students at Santa Clara University later this month. Um, so our, our recordings sure. will, 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 be, <laughs> will be available. Um, so please, please do pass those along to, to your students. I um, just want to let everyone know you're still welcome to put any um, questions in the chat if, if, if you have any. Um, I think something I came into this, this panel um, wanting to kind of know more about um, is just, I, I think it's really interesting that CCL takes such a, you know, uh, specific approach in, in the carbon fee um, approach. So you mentioned, you know, growing up and recycling and being really on top of kind of the day-to-day the -day things that we can do as individuals. So I'm curious if um, your perceptions of, of those activities have changed or, or what advice you have to folks to kind of maintain their, their motivation to take those individual actions while also, you know, getting involved with kind of the higher level activism. Uh-huh. Yeah. Um, such a good question. Um, I mean, it's certainly important to, to walk the talk and doing all those actions have so many personal benefits, you know, in terms of our health and, and maybe your bank account um, and, and, you know, protecting our communities. Um, it's, it's always good to do those things, uh, but we can't stop there. See, that's the problem is, is if we think that those are, are all that we need to do in order to solve this problem, because um, we're, we're not gonna solve the problem that way. We have to have systemic change. Um, so acting collectively and uh, um, getting involved in the political process is, is really the only way to do that. Um, and those two are so linked, you know, like um, Greta Thunberg talks a lot about how she doesn't fly and, you know, she became vegan, but she realized that that wasn't enough. Um, and she raised consciousness in, throughout the world and, and uh, putting pressure on world leaders to do things. Um, in my, my own life, um, I certainly try to do all of those things, um, but, you know, like, I think there comes a point where there's a sort of, we call um, diminishing marginal returns. <laughs> um, so, so it's like, you know, instead of putting all the effort into like thinking about, you know, how can I not use toilet paper? Like, like let me think about how to do political action and, and um, calling my members of Congress more. And those actions are, are really pretty easy. I think in our culture, we make it sound hard. Like we, we put out this, um, these myths about how uh, our government officials, they don't care about constituents and it doesn't matter what we say. And, and it's so hard to get in touch with them. And the only way is if we like 
bang on their doors with torches. <laughs> um, but in actuality, like it's really easy to set up an appointment with them to meet with them in person. And their, their, their staff just tell us that they love meeting with us and meeting with constituents is their favorite part of their job. And they read every comment, they read every email. Um, and our uh, thoughts are important to them. Yeah, and one of our, our panels yesterday, one of our uh, student alumni was talking about, uh, they work in a public elected office and um, he was sharing some insight into, you know, calling your, your mem uh, calling your representatives and um, the impact that it has to really personalize that message and, you know, take some time to um, lay out why this is important to you, you know, on top of, you know, the message that is maybe, you know, pre-populated, pre which, you know, makes it quick and easy for folks. Um, so that's, that's a great tool to take advantage of. Um, I'm interested to know if you guys work at all with um, kind of on the front end of, of representatives and, and the voting process and getting people elected. Um, we, we don't actually, um, uh, since we really try to be nonpartisan and, and to form positive relationships with whoever is elected, um, CCL kind of shies away from like endorsing any political candidates or kind of supporting campaigns. Um, of course, like we encourage people to vote for people who are climate um, activists and, and uh, positive about that. Um, but actually a lot of our um, volunteers will work with other organizations during election cycles to um, help uh, climate leaders get elected. We've also partnered with the Environmental Voters Project um, like in calling and writing postcards to people to help them um, elect people. Yeah, I was, a, I was involved in an environmental organization in college and, uh, you know, that experience of, you know, even just the simple things of doing a park cleanup and, you know, getting outside and in, into nature that can really inspire people to take those baby steps moving forward. So um, I hope that you know, all our students that are with us today will, you know, look into your organization and maybe, you know, consider taking up an internship or a project with you all. And um, if not, then, you know, taking taking steps within their organization to to be more conscious of, of their impact and also ways that they, they can get involved. Um, we did have a question. Uh, do you know offhand if there are any uh, legislators in Arizona that are co-sponsoring the bill? Oh, um... Yeah, I don't know. I think there was in uh, the last bill, which had 86 co-sponsors, but since it's been reintroduced, uh, it's 36 co-sponsors now, um, but you can easily find that out at the Energy Innovation uh, Act website, which I'll put in the chat. Awesome. Um, well, well, speaking of, of Congress, we have our next session um, in just about a, a half hour that, or, or sorry, we had another question come in, so I'll, I'll prioritize that. Um, from Mary, who says, I'm surprised how many presidents of universities have endorsed the project. My university seems to have rules um, or something about not in, endorsing. Can you clarify or comment? <laughs> um, yeah. Um... It would help to know what university you're at. Um, so if you want to share that with us. But yeah, like I generally find that public universities do have a little harder time endorsing their presidents because their presidents are, um, you know, also hired by their chancellor and the state government. So you can't exactly lobby against your own employers. Um, so in that case, like we might ask them to um, write a statement of support. Um, uh, or like they could um, endorse privately um, and like not on behalf of their institution or something. Have you had any student government body presidents endorse? Yes, actually. Um, so one of our partner organizations, um, uh, it's called uh, Students for Carbon Dividends. Um, they created this whole initiative last summer where um, they contacted student government leaders all over the country and they got over 500 endorsements um, from student governments for carbon pricing. That's incredible. Awesome. So we uh, like those too. If you wanna ask your president, student government associations to endorse, <laughs> also very helpful. 
yeah, run for student government, talk to student government, um, get your op-eds out. Um, we, we had a panel yesterday, so there's some, if you visit our schedule, there's a video on how to write an op-ed and some advice on how to get that published. So um, incorporating some, some pieces from today would probably be a great start, so. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, well, thank you for all the work that you're already doing. Um, you know, being, being involved in your community is, is powerful and uh, is the only way that we make change. Yeah, continuing to, to build um, connection and community. So um, we really appreciate you being with us here today and hope this can be, you know, the beginning of a connection with CCL and our students. I know um, some of your representatives have, you know, been in touch with our our chapters about giving presentations and speaking. So please keep that in mind as you folks are, you know, planning your schedule for the fall. Um, this would be a great, great project to bring in. And um, thank you so much for, for being here and to our panelists, or sorry, participants for, for joining us today. Um, and hope you enjoy the rest of our conference. Yeah, thank you for inviting me. And uh, here's my email in the chat if you wanna get in touch directly. Perfect.